Hello, this is Maha Bailey from the American University in Cairo, and I'm going to give an overview of synchronous and asynchronous learning. So there are three terms um, I just want to make sure that everyone understands. Synchronous learning is when we're all meeting at the same time. Um, so something like a Zoom meeting or if we're chatting at the same time via text, um, even if we're not together on video or a phone call would be synchronous as well. All of these are synchronous. We are synchronized at the same time. Asynchronous is when we don't do it at the same time. So like email, I can send you an email this morning and you can respond the next day or the day after or a few hours after. And then there are some spaces online that are semi-synchronous. So these are spaces that are like WhatsApp or Twitter or Slack, if you're familiar with any of these, where we text in small doses. And so sometimes if there's a group of people together in a WhatsApp group, and they all are there at the same time, it feels like it's a chat that we're all together at the same time. But if someone comes in two hours later or a day later, they will still be able to read what we've been writing. This is an important distinction. I think that term is not very often used, but I, I think it's an important distinction because it makes for these spaces has a special uh, circumstances where these spaces then become helpful. Um, when we were surveying AUC faculty over the summer over what they were planning to do in their courses, a lot of them were planning to do things like Zoom or Blackboard Collaborate, so they were planning to meet their students uh, synchronously. Um, a lot of them were also planning to pre-record their lectures and share those lectures with students via video to use in their own asynchronous time. Um, and then there were several other different things that they did. Some of them Student presentations could be synchronous or asynchronous because you could ask students to record them ahead of time or you could ask them to do them live. Uh, you could do group work synchronously using breakout rooms on something like Zoom or asynchronously where students work on their own time. Um, quizzes and exams are usually synchronous unless you do a take home exam. Uh, students doing research would normally be uh, asynchronous. And then a place that's like an informal back channel for students to chat and ask quick questions, a place like a WhatsApp group or a Slack team, those are the semi-synchronous spaces I was talking about. And then online discussions on the learning management system, which could be Blackboard or Moodle or whatever learning management system you do, those are usually asynchronous where people can take their time to, to do them. Um, and it's really important when we come to plan something online that we think about why we would want it to be synchronous or asynchronous. So there are two things to keep in mind, things that take up high bandwidth and then they need high immediacy, then you would use a video conference. Do you really need to be together at the same time to do this? Do you really need um, the quality of the video to be able to do it? So for example, this video that I'm doing now, I'm doing it asynchronously. I'm, I'm recording it on my own to share with other people because I'm just gonna be talking for 10 minutes straight and or maybe more um, and I'm not really interacting with you so there's really no reason to do it synchronously but if I stopped a lot and asked you questions and asked you to share then it would be a more interactive activity so these are the the high immediacy and high um, high bandwidth things because in Egypt you know not everyone has a great internet connection I would not do the synchronous video unless you really need to and then also when people get together on a video meeting they don't have to have their video on this turning the video off sometimes enables people to participate better uh, and have better audio um, then there's things that do need immediacy but they don't need to use the high bandwidth like we need to write a document together we can just open a google doc and work together at the same time and there's a messaging chat at the, on the side or we can WhatsApp each other the, on the side. We don't need to actually open a video conference to do that. Uh, you could also talk on the phone, obviously. But so sometimes when I do online group work, I prefer to make it in pairs so that if somebody doesn't have a good internet connection, at least they can call each other on the phone. You know? And then there are some things that work better. They do need high bandwidth, but they don't need the immediacy. So it's like pre-recording a lecture, uh, giving students audio feedback, um, or even just having discussions, but asynchronously on video or audio. So sometimes on WhatsApp, you have a WhatsApp discussion and you just record voice messages to each other. You don't have to actually call each other at the same time. And then there are things that don't, they don't need the immediacy and they don't need a high bandwidth. Sometimes you just want to let something, someone know something and you can send them an email. You can put pictures in it. You can put links. Um, sometimes you want people to read something. It can have images or whatever, but it doesn't need high bandwidth. 
And of course, you can have a discussion board with text and images, and those things don't take up a lot of bandwidth, and then everyone can do it in their own time. The important thing, I think, is that a lot of people tend to think that asynchronous means one way, like you're broadcasting, but it doesn't. It can be very, very interactive. So for example, if students are writing something like on a public blog, people can comment on each other's blogs. People can write something together in a Google Doc, collaboratively edit or look at someone else's work and put comments as peer review. Um, and then there is discussion forums where people can be interacting around a particular topic. There are a lot of different platforms for that, or you can just use your learning management system. And don't think of asynchronous learning as inferior because because you're giving people more time to work on something, it promotes critical thinking and reflection. When we're all sitting together in the same time and space, you can't make sure that everyone participates and some people need more time to reflect and some people are shy and when one person speaks, it means someone else cannot be speaking at the same time. But when you do something asynchronously, you're stretching time and space. This works really well also obviously for people with slower internet or infrastructure that's not always good. So, you know, some times of the day, several people are using the internet at home or in your area, and so your internet is slower, but then you know which times of day the internet is better and you can do your stuff at that time. And it also works really well with people with busy schedules. So if you have graduate students, they have a full-time job, they have their children, and then trying to find time to work on their courses, when it's asynchronous, they have a lot more freedom to work when it makes sense for them. The problem just is that asynchronous learning has a higher cognitive load on students and yourself because it requires a lot of time management and figuring out independently when to find the right time to work and figuring out how much time something will take and how much effort. And if you're not careful as the teacher or the students, you might have to be working 24 seven checking everything. So you need to set expectations for yourself and for your students. Like you're going to be checking the discussion board, for example, twice a week or every other day or something and that whether you're going to be responding to everything you read or not they need to know that and they also need to know probably that you expect them to be autonomous learners so that they can respond to each other without your intervention all the time and that's also really important for semi-synchronous spaces now synchronous um, just before we go into synchronous spaces to reduce the cognitive load make sure that when you're giving students something asynchronous to do that your instructions are clear and step by step Remove any extra details that they don't need, they're not necessary. Add visuals that support the text, but not that distract from the text. And make sure you avo avoid competing stimuli. So don't put like verbal or visual material to detract from the main message. Now synchronous stuff uh, is particularly really useful for brainstorming or quick fire discussion. It's useful for building rapport and community and getting to know each other and feeling like you actually know each other if you've never met face to face. Uh, it's easier for people, obviously, to express emotion with the tone of their voice or their facial expressions if their video is on. Um, it's easier not to have misunderstandings, obviously, because you can respond faster if someone misunderstands you. It tends to have a lower cognitive load because it's a little bit less preparation for you and for your students. But it doesn't have to be video conference. It can be audio or text, right? And it is difficult for large groups. Uh, but honestly, all kinds of online interaction gets very difficult with large groups if you're trying to keep track of everything. Uh, but not if you realize that not everyone needs to keep track of every single thing. It depends on the situation. So when you're in a synchronous session, all of us together, you need to, you know, make use of everything you've got. You know, there's chat and there's audio. You can let everyone participate via chat, even if not everyone wants to participate via audio. Allow students to choose what they want to do. You can use things like screen sharing, like the whiteboard and annotation uh, on things like Zoom, for, for example. Use things like breakout rooms and small groups for group work. Uh, LiberatingStructures.com has a lot of ideas for different small group activities. Also, if you have like a pretty large class, uh, you can split them up into smaller groups and meet them in shorter time frames. So instead of meeting um, 50 students in two hours, you can meet 20, 20 students, 20 students, 20 students, 20 students for shorter time periods, like a half hour each, for example. Uh, instead of meeting everyone for a long time. Uh, and then use the time in between synchronous sessions to still be in touch with students and follow up with them on asynchronous work or semi-synchronous work. And then when you're in a synchronous session, do some kind of mini lecturing, like 10, 15 minutes of lecturing and then do activities, breakout rooms, let the participants do stuff. Semi-synchronous spaces are kind of like WhatsApp groups, um, Slack, Twitter, Google Docs, Google Slides, that kind of thing. And it's particularly useful for group informal communication between live sessions and for quick Q&A 
students can respond to each other before you even respond to them. So this makes it feel like you know faster than sending email like if you have something happening and all the students have the same question it's easier if they put it there than if each one of them emails you separately so i'm going to stop here <laughs>